subscription to Zoho that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone and welcome to the Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with my good friend and co-host Tom. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. How are well. you, Tom? I, I'm a little bummed. I like that we did an in studio the last time, and now I'm yeah, we're now I'm here again. back, back to uh, talking on uh, computer screens again, using the inner tubes. Yes, unfortunately. It was nice having you in studio for a few recordings. That was a that was a fun time. Yeah, no. Good night. I'm glad we were actually able to get like we had like two or three actually yeah, uh, little things going on. Full show that, and that two uh time hops. So Yeah, so that was uh, very cool. Yes. No. If we're gonna do it, do big bang it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely, we'll plan ahead. There. We'll plan ahead next time you're in town or if I ever come down to visit you. We'll just have like four or five shows to record. We'll, we'll knock them out one after another. <laughs> yeah, we'll just front load the whole thing. Then <laughs> then other than your editing, we're just on break until, <laughs> until we need another load. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I get that working vacation. <laughs> of, of a kind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In that interim, since we sat together yes. and everything, I've watched a couple things. I did pick up and decide to watch the final season of Star Trek Discovery. I watched the first two episodes that are available as of the time of recording. Sure. I've made no bones about it that this is not a series that I watch for enjoyment. I, I think it, it is a little bit of a hate watch for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know why I watch it. I guess there, there some of the visuals I think are kind of cool. You sure. know, it, it's definitely the production values are great. Um, many members of the cast I think are phenomenal. The characters are great, with the exception of uh, the character of Michael Burnham. I don't like her. I, I don't know why the crew follows her. I've I'm not going to go down that particular rabbit hole because I know I've said that sort yeah, of stuff on the show before. Uh, Doug Jones, of course, is well worth the watch. Absolutely. But I, I watched the first two episodes of this final season. And this final season is, again, proving that apparently the next generation is the greatest Star Trek series because I understand Discovery the is. The storyline is fed from next gen. They are taking an episode of the next generation and stretching it into an entire season. Wonderful. I commented after watching an absolute ridiculous situation, well, several ridiculous situations in the, sh in the episodes. And I commented about it on the uh, time shifters, Facebook group. Yeah. And I took some heat from one of the members who, and well, we both took a little heat from one of the members who said that, you know, we give so much grace to some, you know, silly monster movies. And yet we can't look at star Trek discovery for what it is and just have fun and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I understand his point. I take his point. Sure. But here's the thing and here's the difference. I feel I'd have to sort of defend my dislike of Discovery. Yeah. Is there is a certain bar that I feel a Star Trek series needs to uh, rise above. Mm -hmm. Whereas the silly monster movies, I, I don't expect that of them. No, they tend to be one-offs. They tend to be low budget. They tend to be independent. Uh, uh, we we don't mind anybody enjoy having a great time, enjoying taking up the craft and and trying. Um, so sometimes, yes, the silly monster movie not great, but you can appreciate it for what it is. Star Trek ha has God, I, I've even lost track because I'm getting too old. Uh, we're going six, oh, 60 years. <laughs> yeah, we're coming up on 60 we're years. We're coming yes. up on 60 years very quick. So, and it does have budget and it does ha ha have effects and it should have access to good writing and good acting. And when it doesn't do that, <laughs> it disappoints. Yeah. 
Yes, it's it's just not the series I watch for the, oh, just leave your brain at the door and enjoy the ride. No, because that's not what Star Trek's supposed to be. You're supposed no, to bring the brain. I, <laughs> my, my brain should be along for the ride. Yes. Um, now, I'm, I'm never going to bash anybody for enjoying Discovery. No. I know Discovery is a lot of people's favorite series. They love Star Trek Discovery. And you know what? That's awesome because that is, when it is what is going to keep Star Trek moving to that 60-year anniversary. And maybe another 60 years from now, we'll still someone will still be talking about Star Trek. So great. You know, more power to it. It's just when Star Trek goes from trying to teach the viewer about you know bettering humanity and being your best self and all the heady things that every other series has has tried to convey and then it turns into yeah we're going to have someone riding on the back of a starship in warp <laughs> in, in the beginning of the of the of the episode and by the end of the episode we're going to be using the saucer sections of a couple ships like a giant spade to block an avalanche on a planet. God, I saw that too. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's spaceships for space ships. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I even debated this a little bit earlier today with another friend. And, and what, what century are they even supposed to be in? Oh, now they're like in the far flung. I don't know. Are the, the Let's see, their uh, regular trek takes place in the 23rd yeah, and 4th. No, the, the so they're in like. Er, early 23rd century. No, 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 no. Because regular trek was 23rd. Next gen was 24th, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think now they're in like 25th or 26th or 25th, later. They, 25th is where the Picard era ends up. Okay, well, then Discovery's beyond that. They're no. in the far future. They're in, like, 27th then or something. Well, no, I actually, I think they're further than that. I think they're, like, I, I, I have to look it, I'd have to look it up. I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, but I think they're more, like, in the 30th-something century. They're, like, hundreds of years out. Right. Um, but despite being that far out, and I guess I could draw a couple of lines technologically to how you might get to it, but I struggle with a notion that 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 with the ships that fly in pieces, not mm -hmm. connected to one another. I, I, I get the concept. I mean, yes, we have like wireless charging. We have wireless. We have things. But I mean... It, that they all have their personal transporters on their arms. And, and I'm like, then the ship is redundant at this point because you've improved transporter technology to the point where you could probably get across a couple of solar systems without any problem. As long as you have target coordinates, you should be good. And they don't seem to do any of that. They just push the button and they go where they wanted to go. And I know that's getting into the technical weeds uh, of it, but that stuff bugs me. And then, yes, you ram a starship into the ground, and that's supposed to be okay. Uh, like, mm -hmm. every other time we ram a starship into the ground, it doesn't get back up. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the only Even one that does is Voyager, and it's because it's got landing gear. <laughs> I was just going to mention the only starship we've seen in a series that actually was capable of doing this and not destroying itself was Voyager and they only did that once or twice in the entire run of the show because you know what it's a spaceship yeah no it was always one of the things that bugged me in the Kelvin timeline when it, too when uh, they started oh, taking God. ships in, into the atmosphere or under the sea or all that I'm like this ship isn't built to even do what it says it does in space without toppling end over end. And you're going to just fly it around wherever. <laughs> there are some things just to kind of um, defend myself a little bit and to, to Cameron's point about just kind of leaving your brain to the door and going with it and having fun or whatever. There, there are things that I have decided that I'm, I'm just on the losing side of the battle. Yeah. And it's something that they do now with all the series, Strange New Worlds, Discovery, uh, the, the Picard series. Uh, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> now, you probably don't, actually. Really? Well, 
two things. But one is the starships are now like Formula One race cars. You can have a starship that holds thousands of people. That's as large as, you know, your largest building and everything. And you've got it zipping in and out and around asteroids and doing dives and, uh, all, you know, and like, yeah, okay. If you want to say that starships can do this now, fine. But I, it stretches the kind of believability for me that this giant behemoth of a craft of this vessel can perform stunts. <laughs> well, stunts in space is relative, but uh, I see. I never struggled with that that particular element because uh, I, I think you're pulling too far from old school, where it, the effects just couldn't pull off uh, anything reasonable to that effect. But I would think if you have to have something like this, well, while maybe it doesn't dance on the head of a pin kind of thing. But I haven't seen anything in, like, Strange New Worlds where they're flying around asteroids or trying to actually do evasive maneuvers, and they are actually evasive. I'm okay with that. I actually kind of lo- dig the visual. But, but yeah, I get your point. You can take that a bit too far. I, I was almost certain you were going to talk about how it jumps and, and, and jumps out of warp. Yeah. No, I've never... I never liked the instant appearance thing that they that started with Kelvin. Yes. Without knowing how warp technology really should work, I kind of envision it being a little more like that. I mean, if you truly warp space, you're taking yourself from from one point and just instantly putting yourself on another point. Um, yep. If you're to take that, no, then the I get it. Then the pop out does make sense. Yeah, but, I, I get it. It's just. Visually, I don't find it as appealing. No, I get it. And some of it's the perspective. Like, I know you like the next gen where the ship just elongates and then then it's gone. And I get that that component, too. And one could say it's just a matter of your perspective of where you are when that happens. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to give you something <laughs> to hang a hat on. <laughs> but... All the, the all the truly nerdy stuff aside, because that's half the fun of whether you like or hate it, it, it is that's the conversation you get into those. You can at least enjoy the conversation, even if you didn't like the show. Um, yeah. But what really does in Discovery for me uh, as a whole is just the very CW quality of it. Everything is over-dramatized everybody's life's in shambles at all times. There's never a normal day, ever. A- and even if there is a quiet period, we that's when we all get very sullen and angsty and weepy. I know that Discovery is not the only show that does this. It's They didn't invent this or anything. But for some reason, it always really stands out for me when I watch it, is the... We've we've only got this much time. We're under attack. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. So tell me, how about your relationship with so and so? Yeah. Are you going to take the new position if we make it out of this? And <laughs> let's uh, like, isn't there a countdown we were talking about just a few seconds ago? Yeah, the total lack of urgency in the moment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that, and that's what I mean by the CWing of it. There, everything is emotional all the time, whether it needs to be or not. <laughs> Regardless of how you want to do it, it is a military structure. They're supposed to have some kind of discipline. You don't just get on board and say, "I'm just showing up now. I'm uh, I'm Lieutenant Commander So and So, and I I dig your vibe." There's rank. There's structure. There there's training. And everybody is just so touchy feely all the time. And like, how are you getting any missions done? How are you even surviving? And and the biggest crime of them all, there's only one person that can ever save them. And it's the captain who should be probably court-martialed several more times uh, beforehand. I mean, no offense to the actress, she plays the part. Well, it's just I don't think they gave her a good part. No, that's one of my problems, and that's, again, I feel like I'm rehashing stuff I've already said, is, you know, the script forces everybody 
to follow her blindly, but we've never really seen her do anything to earn that kind of respect and loyalty from the crew. No, in fact, if anything, uh, well, actually, I know exactly where they get how she is and what she is. She's Kirk. Yeah. But I think after all of these years, we all realized Kirk was probably not a really good captain. <laughs> he got <laughs> damn lucky all the time, but he, he didn't do things smart. <laughs> no, he was a lucky captain, but he wasn't a good captain. And, and that was bore out of the fact that Gene Roddenberry had to cowboy up Star Trek to even get it on the air. Right. Which is where Kirk comes from. But I hate that we're in 2024 and we had to revert back to to essentially the no thought, action oriented, only interested in what's happening to me, really. I mean, I'll play lip service to the rest of you because I need somebody to push the buttons, but <laughs> it's all about me <laughs> all the time. It, it just drives me crazy. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just leave that. Um, <laughs> It is the final season, which is why I decided I was going to watch sure. it. And now that I know what the theme of the season, and it's like, oh, okay, you're taking a an interesting uh, theme of one episode of Next Gen and turn it into a season-long arc, I'll watch that. I'm curious. Okay. Yeah. but My problem is I still got to get through fourth season. Yeah. Uh, yes. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> On the subject of silly, cheesy monster movies. Yes. That is something else I watched since the last time we spoke i watched a film from i think it was filmed in yeah it was filmed in like 1980 but it didn't finally make its way to like home video until 1985 or something like that yeah it was an early uh fred olin ray directed film called alien dead interesting i do have a sweet spot for these types of films it is a young filmmaker, you know, this is early Fred Olin Ray, who is still active today, but I don't like a lot of his later stuff mm. because I feel at some point in his life, in his career, he just decided to turn his films into more like perversions. I feel like they're just excuses for him to have beautiful naked women around. His films are known for like the, I mean, they are effectively sort of exploitation in that. Gotcha. There is always gratuitous nudity for, you know, there's always someone that decides to go skinny dipping in the middle of this traumatic event or whatever, something like that. So that's whatever. That's, that's who he was. That's the films, you know, they were trying to, that's how you marketed a film to try to get your low budget film into the drive-ins or the movie theaters, you know, you get the word of mouth because some woman took her top off. <laughs> In the latter films, it's all the women take their top off and the B plot is the, <laughs> it's like the, the science fiction or the horror bit, you know? Come for the soft core porn and, oh, there might be a movie in there somewhere. <laughs> This was a film down in Florida, and it is one of these movies where it's just a bunch of people that get together that really have no idea what they're doing, mm -hmm. but they made a movie. And, you know, you, I just love them for that, and I love the film for that. You know, it's a, it's a weird sort of a Night of the Living Dead mixed with the Attack of the Killer Leeches sort of thing. <laughs> you know mash up yeah because <laughs> it's in the florida it's in the swamp and instead of leeches it's zombies but these zombies were made zombies because a meteorite hit their houseboat <laughs> 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 and there are some cracker lines there are some really good little bits of dialogue that just make you smile and laugh there's a conversation between the, the guys a newspaper reporter he's talking to some some old guy that's been living in the swamp for years and everything and the where they're talking about what's going on in the swamp, about how you know all the gators disappeared and this and that, and that the the farmer th thinks it's a uh, giant possums and things like this, and the newspaper reporter says, "Well, that I, I that sounds absurd," and the old swamp guy's like, "That's what I used to say." You're like, well, what do you say now? Well, I say it sounds silly because I don't like big words. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pause it. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, 
I rewound it. My wife came down a few minutes later. I was like, you've got to hear this line. <laughs> I rewound the film for her. <laughs> no, that's that, that's pretty solid. It's nice you get a little of that writing, but it now it feels like you came up with that line and wrapped a movie around it. <laughs> It felt like that a little bit. <laughs> it, and it is just... Uh, Buster Crab appears as the town sheriff. You know, this is Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers. This is Buster Crab. Yeah. You know, uh, he was a, an Olympian and, you know, silver screen and television mm-hmm. star. And this is in his latter days. And he met Fred Ellen Ray somewhere and they got the talking. And they're like, yeah, sure, I'll do your film. What the hell? <laughs> you know, he made a few bucks. and. Yeah. Fred Olin Ray had to drive him back and forth from the from his home to the filming locations and stuff. And yeah, the dialogue's terrible. The acting, everyone else is just a bunch of nobodies. Most people, most of everyone did one thing like this, or maybe one or two things, yeah. and then nothing else ever again. Local theater people they picked up. If that, <laughs> it's probably just a lot of just friends, family, and townsfolk that, oh, you're making a film? Can I be in it? Sure. (laughs) You cost nothing, right? Okay, you're in. (laughs) And you know what? It Yeah, the film's terrible. It's awful. It it looks like something that's been copied six dozen times. But I did just, I found it fun (laughs) just because of what it was. Why don't you see Star Trek Discovery that way? <laughs> <laughs> Had to get the dig in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I get it. It's just Star Trek Discovery, sh- they should know better. Yeah, they, they should. The people making this movie didn't know better. No, no. <laughs> this is close to a first time try at this. Thing. <laughs> I think this is only maybe the second or third film that Fred Olin Ray did. Yeah. So, I mean, he was truly just some young guy had no idea right. and everyone else was like, yeah, I'm, I guess I could be an actor. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I stumbled across it. I was exploring Momitu. That's uh, where okay, I found yeah. it. <laughs> well, we had set you to task on Momitu last episode. So, Yep. And I, I do believe I We'll continue to explore it just looking for these. I found that in their niche section. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty niche. It's it's my niche. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to admit, Momitu is a very responsive uh, with their customer service because I was having, when I first started watching it, mm-hmm. I was having an issue where a, a little bit of text in a, in, a, in a dark line was at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, uh, It said something about, uh, you know, press something for to add or uh, remove from favorites or something mm. it, it it wouldn't go away no matter what i did it, it stayed there and so i found their customer their contact us and i let them know that it that was happening and and everything and honestly within a day they had replied to the message and said, oh, that, that you know, that's odd. Uh, what were you watching with? Were you signed in? You know, they're yeah. asking me questions about it. I'm like, by that time, I had actually gone back in to finish the film. I had to stop it yeah. uh, to go do some other things. And I came back to finish the film, and it wasn't doing that anymore. Mm. But for whatever reason, it didn't hold my spot. So I had to fast forward to where I left off. And I mentioned that. I replied to him. I was like, oh, actually, I had to stop. And I started. It was gone. It must have been just a glitch. But weirdly, it didn't save my spot. I had to fast forward, you know, what it, what I was watching. And and again, one of the questions they had asked was just, you know, what film was this? And so I'm like, <laughs> embarrassingly, <laughs> this was this was dead, uh, alien dead or whatever. And whatever. Well, they replied to that and. They're like, you know, make sure you're signed in. You you, you register an account and you sign in. It should and, and add things to your favorites. It should hold your spot. It's just, I, ho- I hopefully it was just a glitch, but let us know. And he, and they also said, never be embarrassed by what you watch. <laughs> it's like, talk about it proudly and find the people, the people that you, you'll find your crowd. <laughs> and that's what we do here at Time Shifters. Yes. So I really I really like that. So. Uh, well, I'll keep playing with it. I've, if, like I said, I, I feel like they're kind of relatively new in the streaming uh, world, 
So maybe they got some bugs, but I'm going to keep playing around and bet my interaction with their customer service was enough to make me dive back in at some point. No, based on that alone, uh, um, I, I had tended to uh, dig it up at some point, but now I'm uh, I'm going to have to raise its priority level. That that that's just good fun to hear. And at least in this film, the ads were relatively light. I only had a few. There's a few spots where it looked like an ad was gonna load, but didn't. Well, g- given the quality of the film, <laughs> how much would you have tolerated? <laughs> I, I, I know this is your cup of tea, but if you have to get stopped every 10 minutes, I think you might even bail out. The few ad breaks that it did have was only like an ad. Gotcha. So that was that was nice. No, that's so, pretty cool. And it was at decent spots. It was like actually, you know, end of a scene kind of moments and stuff like that. So yeah, wow. so not too bad. I, I I won't say impressed, but not displeased. We've seen worse. Oh, we have from far yes. older um, suppliers. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, I've talked a lot about what I've been watching and doing. So, have you been doing up to anything, any interest, and then we'll uh, we'll move on. I I have. A, a, I want to mention this one more more out of uh, a, um, a recommendation to you, and it fits nicely with what we're about to talk about. We didn't talk about this at the start, but given the movie you just described, I thought I'd introduce uh, my guys' night thing where we watch terrible films on purpose. Um, we watched a Charles Band film, uh, Head of the Family from 1996. Yeah, I have not seen that one. You have not? I. It, it's again, it's one of those, it's stupid. It's not, it, um, acting is actually a little better than I was expecting, but the premise is just so much fun and all you have to do is look at, at a poster. I'm not giving anything away. The head of the family is literally a head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know of the film, but I'm. Let me backtrack and say I don't think I've seen yeah. that one. But it is. A, it was just. It was so much fun to watch. And actually, the guy that plays Myron, who is the little body giant head in a wheelchair. He's really good, <laughs> and, and, and the way they even wrote the character, it actually subverts your expectations. So, as you learn what the, because he he's the head of his family, and apparently he can control the other members of the family because he's the brain, and they all seem to be, they, they seem to be all components of what makes a whole. So it's a neat concept, but he himself and him sparring with the other main character in the film was just so much fun to watch. And it because it's even supposed to take place in like a kind of a hillbilly town, maybe somewhere in the south or something like mm-hmm. that. And the characters don't necessarily line up with your expectations so i was like we watched it because it was dumb but it ended up being really good a lot of fun right nice and i think that's one of the things that keeps pulling me back to a lot of charles band films is that very thing is you think you're going in for an absolute trash yeah and you come like one that was actually a lot of fun (laughs) yeah and, and the reason this came, you brought it to my mind twice because as you're talking about the last film, um, this one does have some gratuitous nudity. Just the, the one actress seems to take off her clothes every second she gets a chance, whether it yeah. meant to her meant anything or not. But in this case, it kind of fits. <laughs> All right, yeah, see. I am a big fan of Charles Band through most of like the uh, early '90s. You know the heyday of Full Moon. Yeah. You know the the Puppet Master, the the subspecies uh, Trancers. Yeah. The, you know that that era. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of films towards the end of the '90s and going into the 2000s where, yeah, a little bit like the Fred Olin Ray, where I feel like 
they it's more gratuitous scenes than not yeah this one felt like this could have been that threshold film Mm -hmm. where he he kind of hit the sweet spot okay right right amount to right amount got the right actress to do it (laughs) hard hard not to be like all right nice job um but uh, all in all, it was just just a really well put together, and but it's still it's cheap, it's low budget. I don't even know how they pulled off some of the effects. I'd love to know how they did Myron in the chair. I mean, he, he, the head looked giant, so I'm not quite sure if that was all prosthetic or what. But they did a really nice job. It would have had to have been in the '90s. I mean, yeah. there is no CGI. Well, I, and I get that it's probably a guy with his face pressed up through the back of the chair and then his hands are sticking out and the rest of the body doesn't do it. They may they may play with some forced perspective and stuff too. Yeah, but uh, knowing that it was meant to be cheesy, the effects fit just right, but were still better than... Like, you had to think about it. Like, wait, no, there's no point where I don't think that this is a giant-headed dude with no body, almost no body. Not too long ago, but a while ago, I read Charles Band's autobiography, and he talks a lot about the making of his films. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do remember that being a subject of of some of the in the book and everything. And I've read the book, but I, I just borrowed it from the library, and I really feel like I want to own that book because I think I, I'd like to have it as a, almost like a reference guide yeah. for a lot of his films. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's probably a good way to go, especially your your love of Full Moon. Well, Empire Pictures, Full Moon, all his endeavors. That was a life, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had some fun, and he had some really bad moments. <laughs> I bet. But the, the the rise and fall and rise and fall <laughs> of, of, of a uh, movie director and producer. <laughs> but... Yeah, if you either haven't seen this one or uh, it's been so long it's dropped from memory, I I recommend you revisit that. You won't be disappointed. I've been tempted to just do a Charles Band marathon, or not necessarily marathon, but just try to kind of go through the entire Charles Band filmography from beginning to end. (laughs) We could at least have the. Uh, we could do a run sometime of uh, the the full moon fantastics or something. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Uh, well, I tell you that that's a really great segue. I think talking about a Charles Band film. Yeah. So let's take a break. We'll listen to a promo from their podcast, and then we will jump right back into Charles Band when we uh, take a look at 1982. 1982's Parasite. Hello. Ahoy. My name is Adam. And I'm Nick. And this is the Bottom of the Stream podcast. A never-ending quest to find hidden movie gems on Netflix. (laughs) Uh, Every week we watch a random movie that we find on the stream and we talk about it for about an hour Uh, yep as well as that we round up the news of the week and uh, we usually mention what we've been watching at the top of the stream yeah so if you're into Netflix and you enjoy watching stuff on there give us a listen join us aboard our podcast boat as we navigate the perilous water available now wherever you get your podcasts 3D The movie fantasy of yesterday is now the terrifying film experience of the future. For technical reasons, the preview you are about to see is not three-dimensional. Be assured, Parasite is the most gripping and frightening movie you will ever see. And in 3D, you will be part of the terror. You are about to witness the future. Be warned, it is a shocking sight. 3D, the ultimate sensation of visual art, now creates the newest, most terrifying form of fear, Parasite. That thing on your stomach. The new strain of Parasite. When it reproduces, it will cast millions of microscopic spores into the air. Just move your legs towards me real slow. Real slow. Experience the living, breathing, terrifying vision of modern 3D. 
parasite. You have only seen the preview. In 3D, you will live the film. Parasite, the first futuristic monster movie in 3D. Parasite. Right, yes, Parasite. This 1982 film was produced and directed by Charles Band. The film stars Robert Gladini as Dr. Paul Dean, James Davidson as Wolf, and is the first feature film starring role for actress Demi Moore as Patricia. The writers Michael Show, Alan J. Adler, and Frank Levering originally envisioned this as a remake of William Castle's 1959 film The Tingler, the story of which is that a doctor discovers that there's a creature that lives in everyone's spine that feeds on fear, and only a person screaming for their lives would keep it from growing and crushing their spine. They further developed the story into what would become Parasite. The creature effects were designed by friend of Charles Band, future Academy Award winner Stan Winston, and it was Band's chance meeting with a 3D specialist Randall Larson that convinced Band to shoot the film in 3D, thinking it would add some commercial appeal to the film. In the film, the world is post-nuclear war. The government appears to be a weak organization that has been infiltrated and controlled by a group called the Merchants. When scientist Dr. Paul Dean creates an organism that he hoped would be a help for humanity, somehow, as they always do in these films, the merchants took over the project to use as a bioweapon. Paul attempts to destroy his work, but is inadvertently infected with this parasite. He steals the only other remaining sample and escapes from the lab. Pursued by the merchant agent Wolf, Paul makes his way to to a small town to hide and work on a cure that will destroy the parasite within him. So far, he has only barely managed to keep it from growing and killing him. Paul is attacked by a gang of thugs who steal the cylinder containing the parasite and end up releasing it and infecting one of the women in the gang. Paul is nursed back to health after his attack by the help of a local lemon grower, Patricia. And Paul tells us that if the parasite is allowed to feed and grow, it will eventually explode into millions of microspores. Each of these spores, if they land on human skin, will turn into another parasite. So the fate of the world hangs in the balance and in your face as Paul and Patricia search for the creature and the cure. I kind of wish I could see this film in a really good 3D environment. The old school way. (laughs) This one, I think, would be a lot of fun. Uh, the funny thing is, I think I read that this was the f- first American-made 3D movie. No. No? Can't be possible. I I, I, want, I wonder where I caught that then. Because uh, at any rate, uh, the, the 3D would have been interesting. They, they, I mean, it's clear there were scenes that... And, and it had that old-school... Um, that 3D thing where we're just going to do stuff to just be in your face because we're doing it in 3D. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, no, it just occurred to me. There's no way. They were shooting 3D films in the 50s. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So it might have been a first of some kind of 3D or using some sort of camera or or something along those lines. But yeah, the first Charles Band. I don't know. It was definitely, I'm almost positive it was the first 3D by Charles Band. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know where I caught the comment, but... A lot of 3D films, things are done strictly for the point of highlighting the 3D. Mm-hmm. Um, you got a guy that, for some inexplicably reason, plays with a yo-yo or something and has it coming out of the audience and whatever. I kind of liked in this film is the things that were happening would have happened. It's just, well, let's put the camera here... And have things jutting out or have things exploding or have them bust through the window and we'll put the camera right here so it would look really cool in 3D. There was no scene filmed exclusively and only for the 3D. There was one. Oh, yes. I I think I know what you're talking about. There's one guy that's taken out with a pipe and then we're, Mm. we're focused on the pipe and the blood starts trickling out. Now, the, 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 the particular pan in on the pipe, just so you could see the blood trickle out, it was totally done just for 3D. There was no other reason to do that. 
I, I was thinking of another one where the guy is supposedly reaching into the cylinder and it's just his hand reaching down, you know, at, at the camera. Yeah. Was the one I was thinking okay. of. Okay, that's a good one yeah. too. But most of the others, let's say most of the others then, where it's the fight scenes where someone's throwing a guy through a window and the shards of glass or the wood are splintering and it's coming and at since you. since we're and, watching it in 2D, that's not as obvious that you're just trying to get that. So, yeah, again, mm-hmm. th- th- those are things that uh, blend into any of the movies. But, yeah, uh, there, there's a couple in there. But uh, <laughs> for the most part, they didn't abuse the privilege. Yes, <laughs> great way to put it. But unfortunately, because we didn't see this <laughs> in 3D, it, it probably did take a little bit away. <laughs> Possibly. I, I still found it fun only because I knew what would have happened, I guess, or what it what I can sort of imagine what it would have been like. I didn't find that I wasn't kind of entertained. It's just it's really slow. Our lead is very bland. There's not much reason for anybody to do anything for anyone. Um, our baddies are kind of over the top. I, I, I was waiting for them to snap down the street. Boy, boy, crazy boy. <laughs> like, it, it, <laughs> yeah, they kind of look like uh, they went to the they went to tryouts for the Warriors. <laughs> And they didn't get the call back. Yeah, I was catching a little bit uh, between uh, Greece and and, and, and uh, West Side Story, <laughs> but uh, like, and, and then was disappointed when the, none of them broke into song. So, <laughs> oh, can you imagine that? Parasite the musical. Yeah, like I mean, we're already in this terrible town, post-apocalyptic. Not really clear why they're still in town or they're surviving, but th- this band of quote-unquote kids <laughs> in their kind of biker-esque theme. Um, there didn't any, seem to be much reason for them to torment the people they were tormenting, and there was no reason for the people being tormented to put up with them at all. And since there were weapons in the there, I don't know why once they walk into anywhere, somebody didn't just shoot them. So. Yeah, because there definitely didn't seem like there was any law. No, there's no I mean, law. these kids were being punks just to be punks because they were bored they didn't have anything else to do so let's go terrorize the towns but yeah why would the town put up with it why wouldn't the town just blow them all away and just be done with it right and and your lead into why we can feel that way about this part was when they did that really kind of non sequitur action sequence as our hero paul is making his way to somewhere given what we learn later it's not super clear why he keeps moving around other than maybe the merchant yeah because he's being tracked by this guy he's trying to stay a step ahead yeah they he seemed non nondescript about that <laughs> when when he when he kind of brought it up but but we so we have to have this action sequence where he stops somewhere else and he, he he looks like he's saving some girl and it turns into a whole fight with all three individuals yeah. in this place. And you're like, so we're just painting a picture. This doesn't but, actually add anything to the film. Yeah. The film's gratuitous nudity uh, yeah. scene. Yeah, the, the, the one time we did anything and it was like, that was completely pointless. Yeah. Yeah, that was there to uh, pad the film to feature length <laughs> and... And to uh, get the uh, the nudity to get the people talking. So if he, if it's in the theaters, you get some kid, you know, she showed her boobs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well and since we are children of the 80s, we would have been those children. <laughs> <laughs> there were boobs in it. <laughs> yeah. I want to watch that again. Yeah. I remember watching this film decades ago. I, it was released on home video in 85-ish. So... Around 85, 86, 87, I, maybe the, the one year or two that my family had cable was when I saw this or something. Uh, I don't, because it's definitely not something that would have shown up on standard over the air television. Yeah. 
It may have been an early VHS rental. I, I don't recall, but I know I watched this many, many, many moons ago. Mm-hmm. And I had scenes kind of vaguely in my memory and everything, but they didn't play out in the film as I remembered them. I really thought, I thought Demi Moore was the one infected with the parasite. Uh, okay. I, I didn't remember uh, uh, Dr. Dean at all. I didn't remember the uh, the punk group and the, the woman there getting infected. And yeah, <laughs> I didn't have any of that in my head. No, th- this was a first time watch for me and I'm kind of surprised because uh, ha- hanging with you at the bot buster, if this had been in there, this seems like something we would have pulled. But I don't remember this one at all. And yeah, maybe ours just didn't have it anymore. <laughs> Very well could be. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Weird. It's obviously not a great film. No. This is, I mean, it's not known as like the classic no. 1982 Parasite or anything like that. I did find it, I think kind of fun maybe for the same reasons that i enjoyed like dead alien yeah. is just a lot of young filmmakers uh we've got this abandoned uh hotel or motel we can film there all right let's let's do some scenes there um we've got this old uh hotel we can film there sure i uh, let's write a scene for that place I, I can't let this entire conversation go without talking about the true star of the movie and where they spent all of their money. The Lamborghini Countach. <laughs> oh, I thought the, the, the foam rubber hand puppet. Oh, no, 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 yes. no, 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 no. That, that was a foam ha- a rubber hand puppet, but they had a Lamborghini Countach. <laughs> yes, they did indeed. And that it was probably the uh, one of the few things where I... You want to talk about you know, what did they possibly get right? Uh, talk about you know predicting the future. All electric supercar. <laughs> Wasn't he looking for methane or something like that? Oh, that's right. But it sounded like an electric. It, it sounded so. like an electric. But you know what? Actually, he could have been more advanced because um, honestly, the electric car is probably not the thing to catch on. Uh, what we need to do is get to hydrogen. Hydrogen fuel cell would be a better, and that would be similar to what his Countach was, although okay, they were yeah. using methane. So, well, that is because uh, a gallon of diesel was twenty nine ninety eight for a oh the oh you know what liquid methane was actually more expensive. That was thirty five dollars and sixty five cents uh, a gallon. You caught caught the prices at the gas station. Yes, and if you just wanted a standard unleaded, that's going to run you forty fifty seven. <laughs> Which was funny because they even made a point at one point. So, uh, dude pulls out cash, and no one will take it. Yeah, yeah, that's no good here. They only want silver. Yep. So, not sure how you were supposed to divvy up your silver coins into those denominations for the <laughs> for your fuel. <laughs> right. Well, maybe that was the... We don't know how long that sign's been there. Right. Maybe that's, that's the prices the last time that money was worth anything. And, and you know what? I'm actually going to... Uh, well, the part I have to take away uh, is that uh, they only set this movie 10 years in, into the future. So mm-hmm. <laughs> a whole lot was supposed to happen from 1982 to 1992. <laughs> so... so think they were a little aggressive on that but but what i got kind of dug especially since this is low budget and supposed to be in the future um despite the fact that it is supposed to be 1999 it's it's not thoroughly clear where we are in time or what's all happened and it actually kind of helps with the 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 low budget part of it that that we we acknowledge there are things we're not going to know we're just taking this snapshot and they didn't try to force some of something Mm -hmm. i liked and i think it's a a little bit of a clever piece of writing is they were going to like okay we're going to put it in the future but we we can't we don't have the budget to make it futuristic right so we'll just add in a couple lines about that it's sometime after a nuclear war right so Effectively, you could say technology stopped for the for 
the everyman anyway. Right, and since so we that, are where we are, we're we're supposed to be in some kind of badlands area mm -hmm. where you're just lucky to subsist, uh, then, yeah, you don't have to hang your hat on anything futuristic that actually happened. Yeah. If this is the future, why why is our hero driving a 1982 Ford Econoline? Right. Well, because in 1982, that was all they had before the bomb started dropping. So, obviously, that's what he's going to be driving in 1992. Right. So, it, it works. I, that actually, using the post-apocalypse... It, that's a very clever way to get around uh, some issues, Yeah, and I then, guess. then they were able to devote their more futuristic aspects um, to just one character, really, uh, mm -hmm. because he would be the elite of that society and have access to that kind of stuff. But because we're not filming in where he's from, we're filming where everybody else is, we don't have to show any of that. Right, exactly, yeah. His home may be very futuristic and, you know, silver and glass skyscrapers and, and all that fancy all stuff. All the women but... wearing aluminum foil. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. St standard fa fancy future stuff. It is the end of the world, apparently, but Demi Moore looks amazing. She does. <laughs> it's, it's astonishing that in this post-apocalyptic world, she can still find makeup and... <laughs> Everything she needs her, to keep her skin looking so fresh and uh, herself so beautiful. Her her hair clean and well well groomed. <laughs> yes. Her clothes unsoiled. Yep. <laughs> she seems to live in the only nice ish house and and can actually manage to grow lemons. <laughs> yeah. What an odd character trait, right? Uh, what I don't know. We needed a re we need a reason for her to even show up at this bar. Uh, have her bring lemons, because <laughs> why not? Of course. No, I I just got a kick out of that. It's just the oddest things. Well, yeah, and then uh, while we're on the topic of things, maybe they got wrong as far as the future. Uh, I'll, for some reason, both both uh, the scientist guy and, and this merchant all have laser guns. <laughs> yeah, and his is yeah, fancy. Not... The merchant's is fancy enough to be just a handheld pen laser gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he can hide in his sleeve. Mm -hmm. He's got the little quick uh, release, uh... and he can cut off a hand from twenty feet away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess it looks cool, but it is a little bit of a far stretch. Especially setting 10 years out. And Only 10 years <laughs> out, yes. And oh, we had such high hopes in the 80s for the future. We did. Uh, we were all supposed to. We're, I'm still waiting on my, my jet pack and flying car. Yeah, exactly. This film, and I think I knew going into it that this wasn't going to be one of those films that really kind of fit the bill for what we were looking for in the theme. I think I was just looking for an excuse to watch this film again and talk about it only because I, I knew it existed. I knew I watched it once many, many years ago and I just wanted to watch it again. <laughs> right. And well, and because of its approach, there's not too much to pick on regardless of their future. They, they, they were a little ridiculous at only 10 years out, but I mean, an alternate fueled vehicle, uh, it, definitely that things went that way. Uh, I'm not saying we don't have laser weapons now, but we have lasers that cut things like that stuff does. So, um, and that that wouldn't have been available in '82. So, mm -hmm. so that, not a fullness, just not a realistic approach. <laughs> uh, I always get a kick out of these films, and it's you know whenever there is the biological agent mm -hmm. that always turns into a creature yeah it's always got to have a face and teeth <laughs> yes yeah and why was it created and i love the fact that dean explains that he thought he was creating it for the government but it turns out it was for the merchants i'm like wait why is that better <laughs> That you were building it for the government. <laughs> and, and, what were they going to do with this? <laughs> well, uh, and, and because the creature has to have the teeth and all that, it, it just becomes kind of ridiculous unto itself because 
it, it, it's it's already attached and feeding off of you. What does it need a mouth for? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make sense because it just sort of keeps burrowing and sort of dissolving your your tissue underneath it. Uh, when we got our first good look at the more larger sized one after it already fed off of Zeke, um, mm -hmm. and, and it went for the girl, I laughed out loud. When, when it's attached to her, it's obviously killing her. It's draining her of everything that keeps her her. Um, she is dying. But when they tried to mess with the thing, it bit her in the leg. <laughs> it's just like, why? What? what the hell? <laughs> it's already eating her. <laughs> like, why is the other end got to eat her too? <laughs> like it's just it was too funny and it's all because somebody poked it <laughs> and it is that fun 80s it is a hand puppet or yes. it is just something being that you, you just drag across the floor with a uh, fishing line yeah, and have some slime <laughs> so that yeah a trail <laughs> uh-huh yeah no i and <laughs> not to go back to the start start of the show but that that that's where fun sits you have to set your expectations correct this is an 82 mm -hmm. film first time for demi moore when she's not because uh, apparently she was doing like general hospital or something at the same time as she's doing this um whatever soap opera she was on but uh but yeah I, you can set your expectations pro appropriately for this to enjoy it yeah yeah no exactly you know she actually i think she was on um What's his name? James Corden. Yeah. And she mentioned that uh, she felt that this was probably the worst film she ever did. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair. <laughs> but but your first probably should be one of your worst. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that is definitely di the direction you want to go. I, I got a feeling for those actors that kind of nailed it the first time, that the rest of their career gets to be a little bit hard. <laughs> There's nothing to build to. <laughs> Say, and that's just that's just me. But if I had an opportunity to talk to Demi Moore, yeah, I'm gonna mention Parasite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, when it is literally your start in your film career. Why not? <laughs> also appreciate towards the end. You know, we've got all this stuff going on. We've got the scientists. We've got the guy hunting the scientists. We've got the punk kids. Uh, you know, the, the, the parasites infected. We find out that it could, you know, destroy humanity. We're doing this, and we don't know what we're going to do. we got to be able to try to stop it. I need my equipment to try to stop it. I need the other parasite. All this stuff is going on. We don't know how it's going to end. The guy leaves, walks, to, takes a walk. I don't know. He goes out to pee. I don't know what he does. He doesn't know how he's going to stop it. He comes back in the next scene. High frequency sound. That'll do yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It is just, they're, 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 and the plot said so. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, that that was definitely, uh, okay. we're going to jackknife the film at this moment because we missed something. <laughs> yeah. I just... I thought that was hilarious that, no, I don't know how we're going to stop it. I need the original, para I need another parasite to experiment on to know how to kill it. And then next scene, sound. <laughs> we, we revisit the punks or something again. And then when he shows back up again, he has the answer. We don't even see why he has this epiphany. Nothing happens. He doesn't like hear a church bell and get it a, you know, <laughs> Nothing. It was an audible chuckle. Yes. <laughs> when that happened. Yeah, no, I, I, I had a, what? <laughs> that, I had that moment right then and there during the film. And then, of course, it, it apparently works. They, they have some high-frequency equipment, and it, the thing in his stomach bursts forth from his gut, <laughs> and they're able to destroy it. And he's apparently fine. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't bleed out immediately. <laughs> apparently, it wasn't ta attached to anything important. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I don't know. You still feel like you've got a gaping gut wound, but that's just me. <laughs> and, and it did just rip through his core. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, like, 
at, at the very least, you shouldn't be able to stand up. <laughs> no. <laughs> we... We we have to move on, <laughs> so you better get up. Just just hold yourself right there, like it hurts. You'll be fine. The, 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 yeah, the movie doesn't work with you still laying here. <laughs> walk it, walk it off, walk it off. You can't go kill the other one if <laughs> if you're busy bleeding out on the floor. <laughs> and the other one is killed not with sound but with fire. It was just that easy. But if you're gonna take him out with fire, make sure it's a big explosive ball. <laughs> Yes, that's true. There was actually a sequel planned for this film. Oh, really? And uh, Robert Gladini was going to return as Dr. Paul Dean, but the uh, collapse of Embassy Pictures brought the uh, project to a screeching halt. Yeah, that'll do it. Your production company goes away. Yeah, you kind of go away, too. Kind of glad it didn't happen. <laughs> it's just, and this just is this one li- little uh, blip on the, the horror landscape <laughs> you don't think there was more to fill in there seeing as how they struggled to fill what they had yeah i don't know i don't know that there was any more story to be told <laughs> well yeah we killed the two parasites and we didn't exactly leave it open well there was that scene as the right before the credits begin we see what looks like the you know the skin of the parasite Undulating. Oh well, sure. <laughs> That's as so much as maybe, maybe something survived. Thankfully, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, there's not much else to say about it. It is a film that you either you're either gonna like it or you're not. I mean, I don't think there's any in between on this. You're gonna enjoy it or you're gonna think it's really stupid. Yeah, and you're gonna only enjoy it for what we're describing. You're not gonna enjoy it because this is a masterpiece. <laughs> I wish it kind of had a, a little bit more of a cult following or something like that, that there might be a 3D print around somewhere that someone was going to show. I wonder if any 3D prints still exist for it. Hmm. Seeing it in 3D would be totally worth it. That would expand on the experience. It, it was clear mm-hmm. that's what they wanted to do with it. They, did, they put the gags in. It would be nice to get the effect. I don't have anything else to say about it. I knew this was going to be kind of a short discussion. As I was watching the film, I was like, well, we really don't have a lot to talk about. I, I can tell already. And, and did, did, did our masses not have much to say? Oh, yeah, no, unfortunately not. Uh, I threw it out to the social medias, and the only comment I got was uh, Billy Flynn actually mentions that he saw this in the theater. Really? And I replied to him, weren't you like, 10 <laughs> and he's like 82 yeah <laughs> i i think that's i think it's awesome it's definitely not the film i would have been taking my 10 year old grandson or anything to but you know everybody's different and i i think that's no. that's a hell of an experience to have that that that's quite the story to tell uh that was not how i'd picture anyone taking that movie in the first time <laughs> no no, it, it is, it was, that's just kind of fun just knowing that I know somebody that actually saw this in the theater in the 80s. As a 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that's the part. So what about, uh, what about the critics? I'm guessing most of them didn't think too highly of it. You would be right. And actually, given what this is, it was hard to scrape, um, critics that I could find from 82 that wrote anything. So uh, bear, bear with the the ensemble here. I, I did actually find these through Wiki and, and track down the actual things. Um, but the the best quote I could get out of one was time, uh, there was timeout.com and they only uh, said staff writer, don't have a named critic. Um, uninspired actors in tone a banal script reduced by clumsy pacing to a minimum of suspense. A fair assessment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but uh, that, that was as much the rest of the, the whole uh, read was just describing what gets you to this line. <laughs> and then we have uh, New York Times, Janet Maslin. The movie winds up more gruesome than scary especially because the 3D tricks 
are both repetitive and infrequent. It provides only a few strong shocks, chief among them an alien-inspired scene that has the creature bursting forth from the body of one victim. These thrills notwithstanding, this is a badly acted B-movie without much flair for involving its audience. Also probably pretty fair. Uh, the last one I got is from Vanity. Also, they only credited staff. So, uh, Pick's raison d'etre is a set of frightening mechanical and sculpted monster makeup effects by Stan Winston. Convincing gore and sudden plunges at the camera are enhanced by StereoVision 3D filming. Otherwise, Parasite is lethargic between its terror scenes, making it a test of patience for all but the fanatical followers of horror cheapies. <laughs> I dug up my uh, Blockbuster Entertainment Guide to Movies and Videos from 1997. Yeah. <laughs> And there, unfortunately, there's I mean, there's a series of writers that add these reviews, so I have no idea who wrote this. Right. But on Parasite, they describe it as, uh, yeah, Moore's film debut is a cheapie about a scientist fighting voracious monsters he's created, one of which is growing inside him. In theaters, 3D gore was occasionally shocking. On video, it's just gross. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that one that I, I read where it pointed out that they were infrequent, uh, that was something I kind of noticed. Uh, I honestly didn't know this was a 3D movie till after I watched it. And thinking back to it, I'm like, yeah, I can only pick out a handful of things that would have been in any way enhanced in 3D, like the pipe. Most of the stuff, I think, would be early in the film. Yeah. And then like, only occasionally... Uh, towards the and the, yeah, it kind of peters out. By the time you get to the action of the the film, yeah. the 3D idea I think seems to fall off. But the the beginning very strong. The middle it has a few, and then as you get towards the end, yeah, it becomes seems to be less of a a, a driving factor. Yeah. Except for I think the when the parasite bursts from his gut. Yeah, you, it is right you at the camera. That and they probably the explosion at the end. Yeah, and maybe that's why. Maybe there was a that was an actual uh, decision. You know, they start out with a lot of it and let it die down, so you get a little. So you're not worn out by it. You're not worn out, and then when it happens again for something like the big blood splurt right at the camera or the explosion, it feels more of a you know, oh wow, I forgot this was in 3D. Yeah. Kind of thing. Well, anyone that used 3D back at that time, anyways, was just waiting for that moment where the the crowd's heads all dart in one direction. <laughs> yes, that's how they know they got that scene right. <laughs> mm-hmm. That I guess will do it for Parasite. We're gonna really shift gears yep. uh, for the next episode. We're gonna take a look at 2006 Children of Men. And I believe this takes place in 2027, if I'm not mistaken. Sounds about right. So, a few more years in our future. We'll see what's ha we'll see what transpires in the next few years. And hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're hoping this isn't going to be a uh, a tale of things to come. No. But that is going to do it for this episode. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Please follow the link in the show notes to all the social medias. Come join us on Facebook, uh, Blue Sky, uh, Discord. We're out there. If there's a social media, I've tried to find it. You know <laughs> that people can interact. Uh, I'd love to hear you hear from you. Get some comments on some of the films and stuff. You can also send us emails: timeshifterspodcast at gmail .com. Tom, as always, it has been a blast. Always. Uh, we will talk to everyone in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. See ya.